Welcome everyone to our premiere episode of the Softwarepreneur Show. My name is Pamela Dale and I'm excited to have our first guest, none other than one of the co-founders of High Level, Sean Clark. Welcome, Welcome Sean. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It's great to see you. Thank you. It's so great to see you as well. We've met a couple of times in person and I'm blown away. First of all, I just want to talk about the fact that I'm not one of the big players out there, but yet here you are on the show with us today. Yeah, yeah I'll tell you that. But I, I have faith. I know where I know you're headed in, in a good direction. That's for sure. Well, I with Go High Level as a foundation, absolutely. Uh, there's nowhere to go but up. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about right out of the gate was partnerships. I know you've spoken yeah. very highly of your partners and uh, Varun, and we've got Robin there as well. Oh yeah, absolutely, my co-founders for sure. And I just on this journey, wanted a partner. One just never appeared or hasn't yet, right? So I sure. was thinking to myself, well, how is it that I want to step out in this next phase of my business? And I thought, well, I'm just going to partner with Go High Level. Perfect. I like it. Right? So as an affiliate, that's one of the choices that I made. Uh, can you yeah. talk to me a little bit about your decision around, first of all, you've got 40% coming as an affiliate, which is high, and why you think maybe we should take a look at partnering with High Level as well? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, for us, I always thought about it like, you know, what is the value we can bring to the table? And also, what aren't we good at? And if if we needed, if we wanted to bring other people along who are good at those things that we're not good at, what, what is a reasonable way to, to, to recognize that and to cut them in on the deal? And I sort of said, well, you know, what would get me out of bed at, at the end of the day? if I was on the other side of the transaction, right? And so when we sort of sat down, we sort of said, well, we feel really good about product and engineering and things like that, but you know, sales and marketing and distribution and strategy, these things are not our forte. And so we just wanted to share with other people, you know, in, in their, you know, if they were successful, it's like, why not reward them in the same way that we, we would get rewarded. And so that's kind of where 40% kind of came from. We felt like that was a meaningful number uh, to really say thank you to people who were willing to go out there and uh, and put us out in the world. Fantastic. Well, I think it's a beautiful number and I, and I agree. I came from the ClickFunnels world, right? That's kind of been yeah, where sure. I, and I had a digital marketing agency, et cetera. And watching ClickFunnels at the moment is really hard. And the affiliate commissions have been cut and they're also not at the development stages that they had promised. How yeah. is it that Go High Level is able to do what it is doing? Well, again, I think it's back to strengths and weaknesses. So, I mean, um, I'm not a coach and I'll never advertise myself as such. Um, and I think from the very get-go, um, we never really thought of ourselves as being that business. And so we sort of said, okay, we're going to stick to the engineering. And, and even on the product side, frankly, when we said we were good at product, we didn't mean like knowing what to build, but just how to build it once we knew what to build. And so we sort of said, okay, who do we need in our lives to help us with this? Um, and we said, well, I know we need, we need great coaches and we need people who understand the marketing side of things. And what we realized when we, you know, again, not, it's kind of funny because being uneducated to this, we sort of saw it as like a one size fits all. But when we started to really go out in the world, we realized, you know, there's no such thing as like a marketing coach or, you know, like a coach at all. There's, there's people with skill sets in all kinds of areas. And so, the bonus prize for us is not only did we meet lots of really smart people who helped us um, and learned along the way, but we realized is that even if we wanted to be, or we thought we were like great coaches, the reality is like, that's a misnomer because that's like saying I'm a great doctor or, you know, it's like, well, what type of doctor are you? It's like, what type of coach are you? And if you try to be everything, you're probably nothing um, because you can't be great at everything. Right. And so for us, we never even started down that world. And so we, we, we spent a lot of time on, on just, making sure we have the engineering and the product production, right? And we really relied on our partners to help us understand like what features should we do next? And, you know, who, what audiences should we talk to? And we've never really, you know, we've never really tried to go that way and we don't plan to. You've chosen to build in public as well, which is oh, very yeah. exciting. Tell me a little bit about that decision. Why, why you choose to oh, build? Gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of things in life are accidents and I'd say that was just one of them. Um, you know, when, we were trying to talk to more and more people. It was sort of like, okay, well, how do we organize this, right? And 
when we, we realized like, well, let's put it on Facebook because not only is it easy to do, but a lot of our customers are already there. Many of the people that we looked at and say, said like, well, we want to we want to eventually talk to those people. They were already there. And so it just sort of became like this snowball that kind of ran downhill. And then over time, it was not just our coaches. That, you know, we realized our customers had a lot to, to, to say about it. And then coaches became customers. And the lines really blurred there. So it was like, well, let's just put all of our customers in, in that Facebook group. And so while I think what we build in public, I think when I say that, I think of it as building in front of our customers. But I don't think of it as like, I don't know. It's not like a one-sided transaction. I think we get and gain as much from it as we, as maybe as we, as we, as we take or get in return. And, and so I think of it as more of a partnership. And if you're going to do that, you know, you have to kind of, you have to have a way to expose what you're doing to your customers. Otherwise, how are they going to know so they can help you along your journey? Right. You had mentioned the bigger something is, the harder it is to launch. And I think, <laughs> I think we see that a lot with software and I think this is one of the distinguishing differences between you and the others. Do you see anybody in the marketplace at the moment or foresee anyone that could come up and be a competitor of yours? There's, there's always the opportunity to be a competitor. So we never, we never wake up and say, oh, there's no such thing as competitor. And in fact, I would say we, we, we become, we, we think more about, look more at smaller players than bigger players because smaller people can be more innovative. They can be, they can move faster. They can pivot more. So we, we definitely look in the rearview mirror more than we look ahead. I think most of the larger companies, it would be impossible because they've chosen a model that, and I think I always say models matter. And I really mean that like the way you structure your company from the get-go fundamentally, it's sort of like the foundation of your house. It's really impossible to go back and fix later. So you got to get that right out of the gate. So we don't really fear any of the people bigger than us. Um, but could there be a competitor? Absolutely. And we're always looking at people smaller than us and making sure that we're innovating very quickly because we never want we, we never want somebody to come up behind us and take us out or or cause us to slow down because we really like what we're doing. In five years from now, at the rate that you guys build, what could possibly be added or what would it look like? What would high level look like at five well, years? Okay, so here's the good news about this, right? So like my real, my answer to that, of course, is not much. Um, but the great news about us is like, it's not about me and it never has been, right? So right. what I know is, and, and this is actually, it's cool. So we work with marketers because they make a difference in the world and they exist because the, the marketing world is changing always. So like, it's funny because thinking back like three or four years, if you'd said like, well, what's going to happen to the dominant, like what's going to happen to the ad world? I would even be like, oh, that's dumb. That's obvious. It's going to consolidate and it's going to be three players. It's going to be like Google and Facebook and Amazon or something like, and that's it. But you know, that's not what the, that's not what happened. What happened is it's actually starting to stratify again. Netflix is coming out with an ad supported platform. TikTok, who no one even heard about three years ago is, is right. so, and, and the market share of the first three is actually now under 50%. So that's the point, right? The things are always changing. And so what I know is five years from now, I'm going to be doing what I'm doing now, which is listening to my customer tell me, hey, did you hear about this new thing? And then we're going to make sure we build that so that way we're staying ahead of the curve. Listening to customers, I watch you in the Facebook group. I watch you at events and you're always listening, got your ear to the ground. Why are you so different compared to other software companies? You, I, I can't even I access also or. <laughs> um, I think we have a lot of, I have a lot of advantages, you know, so. First and foremost, like I don't have to listen to every type of customer, right? I I was lucky, and I, I would say that through and through, I was totally lucky because I happened upon, and, and I didn't do this by myself, you know. But I I happened upon realizing that marketing agencies and marketers make the difference between success and failure for the end businesses, and they're super. I would like like I always like to call them the unsung heroes because no one ever talks about them. They never say like. The reason my business is thriving today is because of this amazing marketing agency I hired behind me, right? Like never say that. They always like, they like to take credit for it, even though it's not true, right? And so, you know, it's hard to discover this fact, but once you do and you realize the magic of it, <laughs> you just sort of like throw everybody else out. And I think the other platforms have had to sort of settle with this idea that they're going to sell to everyone because they're trying to get market share wherever they can. And, you know, we just realized early on, like maybe we build a smaller business, quote unquote, but if that was, you know, originally we we're like, well, if that's the case, who cares? Like, as long as we're doing the right thing. Now, funny thing in doing that, we realize actually we should eventually be the biggest 
platform out there because, you know, I always say I want to be a $10 billion company. And when I say that, I want 9 billion of revenue coming into my customers and I want a billion dollars coming to us, right? Because I know that's the right combo. And if we do that, we're being successful for everyone. We're helping the marketers and the marketing agencies, but they're, we're also helping the SMBs that they're serving as well. So it's, again, it's back to that model. That model means more than anything else that we do. It shines through in everything you do. When I was taking a look at where I was going to plant myself and my brand, it we I watched for a little while, maybe just a little bit too long, right? But I was like, can I really get behind some of the values and things that you're doing? And I saw generosity. I saw transparency. I saw innovation. I saw so much. And just fun. It's fun to be around you. And I think it's software is fun. You've given myself and so many other people an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. And that's just so life changing. I've got a couple of quotes here that I think maybe we'll just open up a little bit more conversation that I've heard you say as we go along. Uh, one of them is <laughs> your worst day is when you come across someone who doesn't understand what you're trying to do. Yes, that's true. Uh, I would say the hardest thing is when someone is unhappy and you know, I know they're unhappy because something's missing, right? Like, you know, the easiest thing is like just some technical thing. That's pretty easy to solve. But it's the it's the model that I think is most important because we didn't just choose a different model. We're we we found we discovered with our customer, and this is the most important thing. Like I, I never want anyone to think that like I I thought of something because I didn't I haven't thought of anything. I've stolen all of it from my customers. Um, I've got all my best ideas from my customers. And so you know, the model we discovered that we call SaaSpreneur, you know, where we're helping people really reimagine their businesses as recurring software-based models, mm -hmm. um, fundamentally has been life-changing for so many people. And I think is really in its infancy. And so whenever yeah. I see somebody like struggling, I just know that they haven't quite caught onto that yet. And it's tough because depending on where they're at in the journey, you know, it's like anything, like once you've decided like, oh, that's not for me, you really close yourself off. And so I think what's hard is to see people turn away from things. Um, and even if I know they'll come back around eventually, it's just tough for me because I know we're trying to do great things for that person. And right. I know that they can, they, they want to be successful. It's just, we're not making the connection. And that always makes me sad. SaaS and SaaS, white labeling SaaS. You see that as the future. Yeah, because I, Tell think, me what you're I think there's this like, yeah. So I think this is like, if you go, if you look at like maybe sort of current day, not current day for us, but current day for most people, software is like this kind of monolithic thing that's sort of created out there in the world. And then when it comes into the market, it's sort of owned by this other person, this company. And you have to sort of like wedge yourself in there someplace, but it's very much that like, it's like, my, it's like mine, like give me. And you have to like, try to like get some breadcrumbs off the table. There's no way to like really own it or be part of it. And the best you get is, you know, you can like recommend it or you can use it and you can try to kind of hide behind, like hide it in the background, but none of those strategies like is very good, right? It doesn't create sustainability. It doesn't share any of the revenue with the actual person who's doing all the work. Like none of that comes through. And so white labeling gives us that power. And truly where it comes from is I would talk to agencies and I'd be like, okay, so like, tell me about your life. And they'd be like, well, I go in, I take this other software vendor, I bring them in, I set it all up, I get it to be work, I get it working, and it's really crushing it for them. And then they fire me because they think that the software, the tool, did all the work, right? And then they fire me and they keep the software. And like they don't understand, but that software like did nothing before I came along. And I really came to understand that as what was really happening. And I was like, wait a second, that sucks. That's totally unfair, right? And you know, so what I was like, well, how can we fix that, right? Right. And so if we remove our brand, if we take ourselves off the table, what we do is we always put the marketer up front and we're reinforcing that message. Like, listen, this is, this comes from the marketer. This comes from the marketing agency. They're creating the value for you. So even if later on, and I've still, I've seen this happen many times, people still come to this idea of like, well, maybe it's the software. Well, at least in that case, the software comes from the agency. So the money still goes to the agency. The agency still gets paid for it. And fundamentally, they don't lose the customer. So at no point am I, you know, are those as the agency getting thrown out on the street and we're like holding on to the money, right? And the other thing is it aligns our interests with our customers. This is a beautiful thing about it. So if you stop making money, we stop making money. So we're like, we are partners in this, whether you get it or not. 
we right. are like really waking up every day thinking, how do we help you keep your customer? Because if you don't keep your customer, you cancel and then we lose revenue as well, right? So we're all on the same page. It really changes that dynamic and makes it, in my opinion, the way the world should always have been. Right. Love it. How is a new person walking in today, starting a SaaS business, what advice would you give them? How would they survive? How would they manage? How would they? Oh, man. So, I mean, I almost think it's easier because, you know, when we first got started, um, and even after I saw a lot of customers doing this, so like, again, I told you, I stole this idea and I, I really mean that. I, I mean, I, I talked to tons of agencies and I saw them doing this and I really, I wanted to like really make sure, like, I love the idea because I'm a SaaS person, but I really want to make sure it worked. And after I got to like 50 agencies who were very legit, all very different sizes, seeing them do this, I knew this was a good model. But for the early days, you know, I wasn't very opinionated on it because I just didn't want to rock the boat. Like, I didn't want to come out and say like, oh, the $2,000 plus ad spend Facebook agency is really a bad idea. But after a while, I realized, well, I was kind of, I was kind of eventually knew it was a bad idea. But once I, but now I'm willing to come out and say, no, that is a terrible idea, right? And I, and as a result, I think it's easier now because here's the thing. If you, most people, what I would say is you want to start a SaaS printer agency, simple. Walk out your front door, go to every small business in your area, and sell them, you know, these, we, you know, these easy, quick, we call them quick wins, but basically these software-based features, things like missed call text back, chat, chat widget on the website, like that kind of thing, and charge 300 bucks a month for it. And here's the great thing. If you've never been an agency, it's easy to teach you how to do. If you've been an agency, easy to teach you how to do. Very scalable in terms of getting to a really good revenue stream. And, and, it, and the great thing is it limits you in no way. So if you have some dream of like, going into a niche later on or providing websites or this or that, you're not cutting yourself off. What you're doing is you're creating a really strong base that you that ultimately you can either choose to just keep scaling and or you can do other things on top of it later on if, it, if you so choose. But the good news is you have this beautiful recurring revenue model that's very unshakable and allows you to do a lot of things like create freedom in your life, get good income coming in the door, all of that stuff before you do something really big like again, the traditional agency model, you know, it's funny because like Facebook ads, do you know how hard Facebook ads are? Even if they're working and they're great. And even if your customers love them, which by the way, most customers don't hang with them right. for more than four months because they think it's too expensive. But the, the difficulty there, they, it's so hard. And the problem that most people don't understand is if you look at businesses at scale, they tend to have a product that they can stamp out a gajillion times over. Yes. And every time they stamp that same thing out, the customer likes it each time, right? It's very repeatable and very that's scalability. And that's what we provide in the SaaSpreneur model. Why do you think people are not being successful? Um, well, I mean, really, I would say it, it's just not, not believing what I just told you. <laughs> because I think the problem with most people is it sounds too simple, right? So I could say like, well, go look at podium.com or BirdEye where they basically do something that's very similar, although even less features, and they're over a hundred million in revenue, and they have really low churn rates. They, you know, they have they have, you know really good three hundred dollar a month, four hundred dollar a month recurring revenue streams from each of their customers. They're durable local businesses. All these things, I can tell people those things until I'm blue in the face. I can show them the data, all that. But at some point, I think it's just whether or not you believe it, and I think it's the difference between you know like two pointers versus slam dunks. It's like the slam dunks make the highlight real, but the two pointers win the game actually, right? right? So I think that's kind of the challenge when people don't embrace the simplicity of the model and the repeatability of the model, that's when they tend to fail. Right, I see it over and over again. It was at the event there in November and I was surprised that there were not more successful people there with more, yeah. more SaaS clients. And I was thinking, I'm a classic overthinker. So I could relate to maybe that I that's some of it as well. And one of the other things that you've said that is really funny is uh, you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. <laughs> that's my favorite quote. I get from Warren Buffett. <laughs> I love that quote. I love that um, one too. That's the transparency yeah, I, that you talk about, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and also I think it, it, it speaks to... Um, how life often is, you know, I think that a lot of people where that quote comes from is in investing, you know, a lot of people will come out and, and, and this is perfect for the marketing world because, you know, a lot of people come out with big claims, right? Like 
I did this or I did that. I hit this hit this revenue number. Or I hit this number of clients. I I have this material possession or whatever it may be, right? But then invariably, what you find out later on is that actually they were lying, or if they if they achieved the thing, they did so in a way that ultimately maybe got them in prison, or they committed a crime, or just you know maybe they just had to lie their way through. Who knows? But either way, none of what they're talking about is sustainable. Is the problem right? And so while up on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, it may look amazing and like what you should be shooting for. But fundamentally, if you tried that path, you find out that it just doesn't work or that you would have to do something that was probably kind of low morals um, and, and maybe illegal, depending, in order to get there. And so this happens in investing as much as it happens in marketing. But what ultimately happens, right, is the tide goes out. Like the, yeah. the, something happens, they get exposed. And so I think what's important about that is in everything that you do, you need to make sure that what you're doing is, is sustainable. So you can do it today, you can do it next year, you can do it 10 years from now, and you can do it a thousand times over. And at no point are you going to feel bad about telling your friends or family what you do. Um, all of those things are super important if you're going to build a really good long-term business. Right. Chat, GBT, and AI, what do yeah. you foresee happening? It's exciting, yeah? Yeah, it's super exciting. Um, you know, I think like everything, it's going to be a great tool to help us do more for our co our customers, you know? So this quarter, we will have our first AI-enabled copywriting uh, come out. Wow. Um, I'm pretty excited. It, it's making really good progress. I think it'll be out hopefully the first half of this quarter. Um, and the idea here is really simple. Like, yet again, listen to our customers, really watch what they were doing. Um, easy way to help do things like write blog articles or social media posts or website copy. And because we have a lot of contextually aware stuff, like you can build a website in our platform, you can do social media posting in our platform, you can do all that, we'll, we'll make it contextually aware. So like when you're in the blog section, it's going to know you're writing a blog post. You're in the social media section, it's going to know you're writing a social media post. So it'll be tuned to that specific instance. And so you'll get a better output um, when you're going in to create that stuff. Very, very exciting. What's your favorite feature on high level or one that's coming? Oh man. I mean, that's like, you know, like who's your, what's your, who's your, you know, favorite, which child? One's your favorite child? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I'm excited about so many things because, you know, on one hand, um, I can always say like, I love the new features. Like we have, uh, obviously the AI is cool. I love that. We have like AB testing for email. that's just about to pop out. And I think oh, that could be so ridiculously exciting. cool. Yes. So, you know, like, um, and so I think that's amazing. Um, I love, I would say I, I love how the system is still starting to mature. And this is kind of yes. a weird thing to say, but like, like when I see features come out now where I'm like, oh, cool, that's not a new feature, but that just really rounds out that part of the product to make it more established. Like we just came out with two-way email sync for Outlook. We're yes. about to come out with two-way two email sync for Gmail as soon as Google gives us the thumbs up. Uh, but that right there is, it's a new feature technically, but it's really just a big enhancement because if you're attacking, you know, more of the traditional B2B kind of sales motion, or you have clients that do that, it's a really important feature and it's a very mature feature. And it's, I'm so I'm excited about stuff like that almost in some ways more, because again, I think about our customers every day and I'm like, okay, how can I make them more money? And really what that means is like, if you walk into a sales pitch with a customer, I never want them to say, yeah, but do you have this? And boom, they've just deflated your entire sales pitch. And something like two-way email sync is one of those ones where you could love everything about the system, but if your salespeople can't do that, oh, I'm sorry, we can't use that, right? right. And so for me, I'm excited about adding those types of features almost more than anything else. The Two-way email sync is very sexy. And then I think it's just going to domino so many of those objections that are out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Or, or that was like in payment gateways. Yeah. Or adding payment gateways. And authorized on that, right? Yeah. Like, and, you know, I'm excited about that because, again, same thing. Like, you know, what we know is, like, you went to a client and they're like, yeah, but we already have payments with Wells Fargo or whatever, right? And you, you just want to be, like, be able to say, like, oh, no problem, right? Like, you need to make that, like, a no problem. And authorized.net and NMI will let you do that. I'm excited about that, right? So that's not like a, that's not really that sexy. It won't really enable any new features, but what it will do is let my customers do what I want them to do, which is go in and just bat down any kind of like, yeah, but will it do this kind of complaint and make the sale? So for me, those are more exciting things. 
what do you do for fun? How do you maintain the energy and the drive and the passion for what you have? You're always working. Skiing. I love to ski. Do you? Where, <laughs> where have you been recently? Uh, oh, well, I live in Oregon. So um, I'd like to drive to the closest ski area. I'm not picky. Um, I, you know, if there's snow and a hill that goes like that and something <laughs> to drag me up it, I'm good. So, um, you know, where, wherever. Um, but, you know, I'm lucky. I live I live about an hour and 15 minutes away from a, a, a decent ski area. So he, yeah. I'll head up there whenever I can. Um, and and I, I like to do it with my family. We, we enjoy doing it together. So that's also fun get to spend some family time. My son is a hot dogger of a skier. So it's a lot of fun. I'm terrible. I'm slow, but it's fun. I enjoy it. So yeah, I'd say that's about my only hobby. Yeah. Well, one last question. Uh, I'd like to dig into a little bit more around personality and things like that. So yeah. What pain do you enjoy having? Pain? Yeah. Oh, enjoy? Yeah. Uh, I guess, I mean, I, I guess I try to stay healthy. So maybe like when I go to the gym, it's nice because at least I feel like I can tell myself uh, that I'm improving, right? Like, um, you know, I try to remind myself there are very few things in life that feel comfortable when you're growing, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think, and for me, that's really exceptionally hard. I'm a super sensitive person. I don't take criticism well, um, but I try to remind myself, like, it's really hard to fundamentally grow as a person in any way, physically, emotionally, mentally, without some kind of struggle. It's just how it is. And it's crappy and it sucks, but it's kind of like, um, actually, I'll tell you what, uh, I remind, I try to remind myself of this every day. So this is the weirdest thing, but I was once at a mastermind, one of my very first ones, and this guy named Mike Cooch was talking. Yeah. And some person asked one of these questions I hate. It's like, hey, what do you do in your life to like keep yourself sharp or like what's a daily habit or something? I hate those questions. But Mike was like, oh, well, one of the things I do is I take a cold shower every day uh, for like whatever, 30 seconds or something. I can't remember. And for whatever reason, I, I said, you know what, I'm going to try that. Now, I didn't think about it at the time. The guy lives in San Diego. So the water is just a little warmer there maybe than here. Yes, that but up there. Every day, <laughs> exactly. So every day since then, I have done that. And I think what I do, why I do it, I know this is so weird, but the reason I do it is to remind myself that I can, even though it's painful, it's like, it's, and when I'm done with it, it feels great. <laughs> and so it just reminds me every day, like I can do this. It sucks. It's not fun, but what I'm, I'm done with it. I feel great. And it just reminds me like things that create growth are, are often painful um, and often difficult. Um, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> very true. Very true. Well, Sean, thank you so much for your time. And hey, I, thanks for having um, me. It's great to be here. It's such a pleasure. And I, I absolutely love Go High Level and I'm honored to be a part of this company. And thank you so much for, well, for everything I can't wait to see you in because one of my favorite things to do is give you a hug. And if no, if people don't know you, you are, a, that you should know that this woman is lovely in every way possible. So you're, you're in great company. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have to cry together again. <laughs> I know. Very That's my soon. Favorite thing to do. All right. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye.